Good morning, one and all, and welcome back to the Damage Report with me, John Idarola. I am very lucky to be joined on this auspicious day by the host of Reactions as well as contributor to Rebel HQ, Ravana. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. And auspicious? That's a great word. Honestly, that's going to be my uh, my word of the day now. <laughs> <laughs> I've spent all of my uh, vocabulary points on that one word, and it's all dumb from here. But anyway, uh, glad to have you here, um, and glad to have you. Uh, you're going to be presenting some stories that you picked later on, so that's uh, that's exciting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I am as well. So everyone, definitely buckle up for that. Buckle up as well as we jump into pretty awesome rundown. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's going on at the border, how the Supreme Court is weighing in, and what it might say about what's going to happen over the next few months. We've of course got Marjorie Greene and Lauren Boebert beginning a war that I just desperately want to stop. I don't want to see these two fighting. Come on, guys, get along and push for all of those policies that you have thoughts on or whatever. Anyway, so that'll be a little bit of fun. We've got a candidate totally making up his background. Media Matters made an amazing mashup of Tucker Carlson's misinformation from throughout the year. And then once we jump into the aftermath, we've got this anti-abortion priest. He's a priest like many right wing commentators are comedians. So anyway, we're gonna talk about that. A woman goes undercover at an abortion crisis center. There's just a lot of really interesting stuff and I can't wait to get into it. So. In anticipation of that, please hit the like button and share the stream. And if you want to reach out to Ravana or myself with any comments, tweets, super chats, anything like that, we'll respond as we go. But with all that said, Ravana, are you ready to start the show? I am so ready. I am too. But um, heads up to the TD, hold off just a sec on launching the first block. I just want to mention a bit of breaking news that I, I noticed. Um, we're just seeing this right now. And I know it's going to blow all your socks off. Nobody could have seen it coming, but. It has now been announced that the Taliban is banning women from universities, which is weird because I distinctly remember when they very specifically said they weren't going to be doing that. And then they started banning them from certain types of schools and they banned them from doing the college entrance exams and they banned them from athletics and now indeed are banning them from universities. It's so weird that the Taliban ended up looking so much like the Taliban. So anyway, um, look, it's not like we didn't know that this was a possibility when uh, America was no longer there. Um, it just, it, it's such, it's so ridiculous the way that they tried to pitch themselves purely for like foreign investment purposes as being anything other than what they are. These, like some men in America, are the most broken, pathetic slugs of men on the planet. Their whole point of getting into power is to stop women from doing things, to strike back at women. For all the inadequacies that they feel. And look, it's obviously complex and it's a different cultural context, but uh, you just hate to see it. Anyway, Ravon, I know that I'm springing this on you. I'm just curious uh, uh, about your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I for one am shocked that the Taliban went back on their word when they explicitly said they wouldn't. I mean, if you can't trust radical terrorists, who can you trust? Yeah. I, d- I don't know at this point. Literally stopping them from playing cricket. What what is up with you as individuals? What is up with you as a group, as an ideology, as an idea of what the culture could be? Not what the culture is, let's be clear about that. This is being imposed on a lot of people who have no interest in it. But just how sad, how pathetic the world that they wanna create. Again, that doesn't mean that it's the the US's role to come in and and take over the nation build to, to whatever, but But I can look on it as a person who wishes for far more for the people of Afghanistan to not have to uh, to dwell in this this literal the hell on earth that they're trying to create. That is what they're doing. Anyway, just a little bit of breaking news for you. And with that, let's talk about our own problems uh, going forward as we launch into our first prepared story. This is the biggest story in recent. We'll get to Tucker Carlson, don't you worry about that. But anyway, let's start off with just a general talk. What the hell is going on with Title 42? It seems like every day it's it's gonna be taken down, it's not gonna be taken down. They're considering it, they're appealing. The stay has stopped, the stay has started. Um, well, as of right now, the end of Title 42 has been itself ended at least for right now. Supreme Court, uh, Su- Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts just yesterday temporarily halted what was going to be the planned end of Title 42, which was set to happen on Wednesday. That's the policy that allows the US to expel migrants at the southern border. 
without the chance for asylum. It's been a policy for a few years right now and it's gone through many ups and downs since then. Roberts issued this administrative stay pending the high court's decision on whether to take up the case, which we'll talk more about after a coalition of Republican led states earlier Monday asked it to intervene. An appeals court had already denied the state's bid to retain the controversial policy last week saying that this group, this is the appeals court saying this group of states had waited way, way, way too long to get involved in this court case. And so they were gonna allow it to be lifted. Now the Supreme Court has jumped in to save, I guess, the one of the favorite MAGA policies at this point. If you're not familiar with Title 42, in the early days of the pandemic, the CDC issued a public health order that officials said aimed to stop the spread of COVID-19. In court papers, the lawyers for the six different families who, who entered the US who have launched this suit argue that COVID-19 was always a thinly veiled pretense to increase immigration control. And so right now, the ability to, of officials to swiftly expel migrants at the border is still gonna be in effect for weeks, months, a year. I don't know because they're not saying and we know how how fast the US judicial system tends to work. But but before we jump into our conversation, I do just wanna say to the point made by the families that it's a thinly veiled pretext. Let's be clear, it was a it was maybe, maybe a reason very early on. We didn't know about COVID, we didn't know all of that. Then it became a thinly veiled pretext for some time. To be clear, it's not thinly veiled at this point. When Fox News talks about Title 42, they're not pretending to care about COVID. Why would they? They don't believe that the pandemic is a real thing or matters. No, it is just talked about as a means to stop migrants from coming in. So if there was a thin veil, it has been cast off a long time ago. Anyway, Ravon, I know that you have a lot of thoughts about this. Yeah, um, as far as it being thinly veiled, I mean, you can see that in the media ramp up leading up to the Supreme Court decision. Fox News has been running endless stories about the the newest migrant caravan that is invading our country, which I think is such a funny term to use. It's if this is an invasion that you are scared of, then this is the weakest country on earth. These are people with almost nothing that they're bringing with them who are fleeing desperate situations and just seeking, trying to seek refuge, trying to seek asylum in the United States. So, so to frame them as some dangerous you know, force is ridiculous. The other thing they also try to say is that they're doing this to help protect victims of traf, human trafficking who are being brought in. But the issue with that is these migrants become significantly more likely to become the victims of human trafficking when they're forced into these encampments just outside the United States border. That's it is an point. extremely dangerous situation there for these people. And one other thing I wanna say before we continue on is the framing of them as illegal immigrants. Then you know the term would be undocumented, but they call them illegal. But it doesn't matter because that's not what this is. These are asylum seekers, which is a legal process of immigration. They are coming to the United States border. Uh, you know, declaring that they're seeking asylum, a legal process. So they're not coming here undocumented. And then so framing it in that way is just a you know disingenuous way to play to their ex- exceptionally xenophobic base. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, that, that was that was a, a very good point, very nuanced take. Um, you could, in theory, look at different sorts of migrants coming for different reasons. And if you wanted to draw some sort of distinction where, like if you were a Christian, you were trying to claim some sort of moral high ground, you would say, you know, obviously women fleeing domestic violence in Guatemala, we're gonna help them in, but but these guys are just coming to take our, like you'd say that it'd be awful in a variety of different ways. You could do that, they're not doing that. They they like let's be clear, they don't give a damn what people's reason is for coming. And also they don't give a damn what happens to them when they're stopped at the border or when they're cast out. If they go to these camps, if they get sick and die, if they get raped, if they get beaten or murdered or turned back and have to make a trek of hundreds or thousands of miles back to God knows where, they don't care. They're not interested in literally any of that. And they would really prefer if you didn't bring it up. It's rude of you to make them think about that sort of thing. Um, and look, to be clear, the number of uh, of border crossings is projected that it would go up if Title 42 were taken away, at least in the short term. They have no idea what it's gonna look like a year ago. They never, or a year from now, they never do. But But also, it isn't, I don't think the disaster being presented on Fox News it would go up, the estimates seem to show like a quarter, it would. Is that a good amount of people? 
Yeah, it seems like a lot of people. Should the communities right on the border be required to deal with all that? No, I think that the federal government has the capability and the funding to help resettle people throughout the US. But again, that's not what they're asking for at the border. They're asking for at the very least them to be thrown out. And as we'll see when we get into Tucker Carlson, possibly quite a bit more than throwing them out. Maybe stopping them at all costs from getting into the country in the first in the first place. Anyway, Ravana, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. But again, what is the concern? What are they afraid of? If the number goes up by a quarter, if the number goes up by 100%, you know, a whole other 100%, what difference does that make? How does that impact the people who are, you know, fear mongering about this immigration border crisis? How does that impact you? What damage, what so so called damage does that do to the country? And they can't express that in a way other than they're encroaching on Western values. They're encroaching yeah. on their idea of what America is supposed to be. I've seen, you know, right wing commentators say that they're coming here and they don't speak English. So they shouldn't be allowed in. Last time I checked, the United States doesn't have an official language. So if it doesn't have an official language, the language obviously, the official language can't be English. So who cares one way or another if they do or do not speak English? I mean, the, the fears are just so, so racist to their core and so, so unfounded in reality. I mean, the other thing they'll say is they're gonna come in and they're gonna, you know, vote Democrat. They can't vote. So it's that's irrelevant too until they become citizens. So I, I just I fail to understand what the fear is supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's also so if your fear was that they're just going to vote Democrat. So first of all, you could I don't know, not make yourself clearly the bad guy in this case if you wanted them to be interested in your policies. I mean, a lot of these migrants are coming from countries with fairly conservative Christianity at sort of the core of their culture. In theory, they could find some of your social stuff maybe appealing. And by the way, you guys also say that in the last couple of elections, like Donald Trump is far more appealing to Latino voters or something. Well, okay, but then you can't at the exact same time say that every single migrant that crosses the border is obviously going to be a big fan of Pete Buttigieg someday. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Oh, by the way, also, like your main argument for decades, I mean, your main. I would say the the subtle version of your argument is that uh, we hate these cultures. They're going to come in. They're going to take our women. We hate them. They're dirty. That that's pretty clear from people like Tucker Carlson. But the main, I guess, substantive argument you would make is that they're coming in and that they're taking jobs. But you guys also will not stop saying that American workers are lazy and they won't work anymore. And we need more competition to drive down wages and all that. Like again, that is that is what they have been saying on a daily basis for at least a solid year and a half at this point. So. Like, are you guys talk constantly about the need for our population to grow and all that? And how do you think that's going to happen? You think it's just going to be conservative right wingers? I doubt it. They've never had satisfying sex in their entire lives. They're not going to suddenly start popping out more kids. They're already doing their best. Take a look at some of these right wing pundits. Can you expect women to want to go to bed more often with them? But anyway, look, what was lost from all of this is any sense of humanity or compassion. I'm not saying it's a super super simple situation, and I'm not saying it's not a situation. But I don't think that just lining the border with containers like they've done in, I think it was in Arizona, is the answer. I certainly don't think that force is the answer. And we're, we're gonna turn to that actually in a minute. Any more thoughts before we move on to, uh, to Tucker Carlson, how he's been presenting this to his audience? Yeah, I'll just say that right now, like Title 42 is a huge issue. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Right now, one of the arguments that these Republican states are making is that it's a drain on their resources, that they have to allow undocumented children to attend their schools, their public schools, and provide them an education. And right now, there's legal battles going on to, although it's a decided issue, to make it not the case that undocumented children in this country are guaranteed an education, which is really concerning. And, you know, we see the same thing with the Supreme Court here. It's, you know, an ideological institution that is heavily favoring the right, right wing, far right conservative ideology currently. And their decisions are not based on any sort of like fundamentals of, of, of legal theory. It's based on what the Federalist Society tells them to do. So we, there's like serious concerns right now over what how this country is going to treat you know uh migrants immigrants moving forward regardless of what congress wants to do regardless of what the president wants to do because we have this third branch that is so far to the right 
and and does not care about legal theory, does not care about a, a real justification for their arguments. They're just making ideological decisions. Okay, with that, let's turn now to uh, that. That's sort of the reality of what's going on. Let's turn now to how the right is being. Uh, I, I would I would argue just triggered by right wing pundits about this, the version of this that they're getting every night, starting with this. This is the biggest story in recent American history, a total change in the American population, millions and millions and millions of new people. The country will never be what it was five years ago. Even if you're for this, you would acknowledge this is a big deal. And it's completely ignored by the media, except when they are forced to respond and they tell you to shut up and stop complaining. Okay, so uh, the media is constantly talking about this. It is literally everywhere. Uh, Tucker Carlson knows that he doesn't care. He has to present every single thought that he said, every single thing that he says, every thought that he has as unique, even if every other right winger is saying the exact same thing and something that he's not allowed to say, despite the fact that he says it to millions of people every single night. And there's an entire news network and a bunch of news network copiers of Fox News that are saying the exact same thing over and over and over again. But anyway, it's super original thoughts. So America will never be what it was five years ago. And again, the the longing for some sort of like mythologized version of what America is, is a constant in conservative thought. But to be clear, America is different every five years. We've been through a pandemic, we've been through the Trump years. It's been a complex time, there's no going back from that. And when it comes to immigration, not only do we have the issue with Tucker Carlson there, where every single story about immigration has to not just reference the great replacement theory, it is the entire foundation for everything that Tucker Carlson says. So if people from Colombia, if people from Peru, if people from wherever decide to cross the border, it's not that they've made a possibly difficult decision combined with an arduous trek of hundreds or thousands of miles to better their own personal life, to escape political persecution or domestic violence or anything like that. No, they're doing it because Chuck Schumer and Kamala Harris want them to. I guess they got a letter in the mail, come on over. Um, it has to be a plot and you have to forget the fact, the I would think undeniable fact that there has been immigration in America since the very beginning, it has been a constant. There have been massive waves of immigration. I'm here now, you'll notice I'm not picking olives on some hillside in Italy. Weird how that worked out. How the hell did I get over here? It might be worth looking into. I don't think that Tucker Carlson's family was here a thousand years ago. But you'll notice that he doesn't have an issue with those sorts of immigration. Although many Americans did, by the way, Italians were quite persecuted in their time. And so forget about the history. Forget about the fact that America has had tensions over immigration from the very beginning, that is true. But has always managed to integrate new populations and I think indisputably has been strengthened by both the, the, the labor participation and the cultural contributions of different populations at different times integrating in different ways. And so look, there's obviously a lot here and we're gonna get to more of the video, but Rayvana, what do you think about the way he's presenting this? I mean, I think it's just fascinating to say, you know, America will never be what it was like five years ago. Because if you look at videos of Tucker Carlson talking about immigration five years ago, he wasn't saying that you know America was some you know at its peak of culture five years ago. He was saying yeah. the same exact thing that America will never be like what it was before. So it seems like you know just a ridiculous argument on its face. But also you know the last time that amnesty was granted to undocumented immigrants in the United States was under Ronald Reagan. So now this like huge shift, uh, this this huge culture war shift about immigration that's happened, and to see all these conservative pundits talk about how horrible America would be if we, you know, granted amnesty to these undocumented immigrants, while simultaneously they're constantly praising Ronald Reagan and his policies as like the yeah. peak of America. It's just so silly to me. Yeah. Well, why don't we get to a little bit more? He brought on guests to talk about what's happening specifically in El Paso. Let's take a look at that. It's heartbreaking to see it to happen of all places to El Paso, which is such a nice little town and such a success, particularly compared to the city right across the river. I don't understand, and you probably don't want to comment on this because it's your state and you're in politics, but what, why does state government put up with this? Like, why don't they secure the border? They have men under arms 
that they, they mean the governor, control, like why put up with this for one minute? Yeah, I think it has frustrated everyone, uh, local level, certainly at the state level uh, in Congress. It's frustrated me in Congress as well. But we have to we have to remind that this is exactly what Democrats wanted. A year ago, House Democrats hosted the vice president in El Paso. There they had a press conference that said, welcome to the new Ellis Island. When people often ask me, hey, what's what's the administration's plan? This is their plan, Tucker. We're seeing it unfold. And, and this is exactly what they want. They want tax taxpayers to pay for this uh, influx of, of migrants that, as you pointed, are going to all parts of the country. This is exactly what the Democrats uh, want. We have to fight them with everything we, we can, and that starts in the House. I agree with that. No one's even pretending this helps America. They're not even telling us that anymore. They know it's hurting America. That's why they like it. I, to, to be clear, I made a case for why I thought it might help America actually just a minute ago. I feel like a lot of people doing that again, making up fantastical straw man versions of the other side is uh, should be below a professional persuader, professional communicator, but that's the best that Tucker Carlson can do. They like it because it hurts America is it's ridiculous. You, you say that to an audience that you have no respect for, that's what you do. You present basically everything that's happening as part of a plan and that's why we talk about conspiracy theories, but it, but it is broader than that. The problem with the right isn't a conspiracy theory or multiple conspiracy theories, it is conspiracism. It's the idea that everything is planned, everything is intentional, everything has a design, everything is being manipulated from behind the scenes. Is it not enough to say, I disagree with the Democrats and their policy on the border, even though bear in mind that Joe Biden gleefully allowed Title 42 to continue for a very long time, maintain many of the same uh, uh, Donald Trump border policies for the first half of his first term. The idea that he's opened the border is ridiculous. It should be below any serious conversation about politics. But again, it can't just be, I disagree with, their do, with what they're doing. They don't seem to understand the damage that will be done. They have to present it as if to a, an audience of dim-witted four-year-olds that they want this to happen. They're somehow communicating with populations in Honduras to ask them to come over. How exactly would that even work? This is so stupid, so stupid in so many ways. El Paso is not a little town. What are you talking about? It's two thirds <laughs> the size of Austin. Have you literally ever even been to El Paso? Why are you pretending to understand El Paso? I don't understand anything that he says. What do you think about this, Ravana? I think. What I liked, but also which made me the most angry about that clip was that they um, they don't say how it hurts America. They don't make that case at all. They just operate on the assumption that everybody should already know how it hurts America. You know, he doesn't say it's going to do this and this and that. The only thing that he mentions is that it's bad for American taxpayers. But you know who pays taxes? Immigrants. Migrants, even undocumented immigrants, pay taxes. They they can and they do, especially people seeking amnesty in order to work in the United States. Not amnesty, excuse me, uh, asylum. To work as an asylum seeker in the United States, uh, you have to get. Uh, an I-10, you have to pay taxes. So these are not mm -hmm. people who are coming here and not paying taxes. But what, what is true is that they come here, uh, they pay taxes, and they do not have access to the benefits that the yeah. you know uh, United States citizens have from their tax payments. Yeah, I just, I, I get that the way that he lies about literally everything in politics, and we'll get to his overall lies throughout the year, is is designed to generate an audience, and clearly it's working for him. He's he's gotten rich off of it. So I don't know. Maybe we should maybe we should try it. Ravana, what you just said, no one lets you say that. You've been silenced. You're told to sit down and shut up. You you didn't say the thing that you just said. That's what the media said. <laughs> God, been canceled. So condescending, the lack of respect for anyone watching his show. Anyway, with that said, um, oh, oh, let me make one extra point. The, we don't have it in the clip, but the guy that he was interviewing, he said of the stay for Title 42, it's a stay of execution. Because again, in the same way that they talk about migrants crossing the border as they literally always have as an invasion, uh, if it isn't, if it's not stopped, if it is in fact lifted, you will be executed effectively. That's the metaphor that they're crafting. How, why, nobody knows. They're certainly not saying, but you should be scared for your life and the life of your family.
Anyway, with that said, we're gonna take our first break. We come back, a little feud developing between two up and comers in the Republican Party. We'll have the details after this. Okay, that got a little bit serious. Let's have a little bit of fun starting with this. Someone who we all respect, Marjorie Taylor Greene, says Kevin McCarthy is gonna be a great speaker. I guess you'll have to ask Marjorie about that. I'm, I'm a fan of hers, I'm an admirer, but it's not something we see the same way. Lauren? Uh, well, you know, I, I've been um, aligned with Marjorie and accused of believing a lot of the things that she believes in. I don't believe in this, just like um, I don't believe in Russian space so, lasers. Are, are, are you a hard no? Space lasers <laughs> okay. and all of this. Ooh, a little bit of a few developing there. Marjorie Green. And Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates, by the way, obviously disagree a little bit on who should be the speaker. That's perfectly understandable. They have a difference in opinion about Republican leadership, and Marjorie Greene's been very clear about that. Uh, Matt Gates was satisfied to just say, I respect her, disagree with her on this. But not Lauren Boebert. <laughs> Lauren Boebert instantly was hostile and aggressive in that, which I love. I love it. Marjorie Greene did not, and we're gonna get to her response to that. In just a second, but Ravana, what did you make of what you saw from Lauren Boebert there? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I love to see two idiots fighting, so I'm excited <laughs> to see the rest of the segment. Um, I, I think it's interesting because I see why Marjorie Taylor Greene would want to, uh, you know, prop up Kevin McCarthy for speaker because she's been treated favorably by him. Um, she's gotten more access to like the core of the Republican leadership recently. You know, she was talking about how <clears throat> her and some other Republicans. Uh, including Kevin McCarthy meet and she referred to it as the the five families. So Lauren Boebert has gone against the family here, <laughs> which was a but you know, Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates are, you know, uh, sort of persona non grata for the Republican Party. She barely won her election. So she, there, she's not like the Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is this sort of, you know, uh, poster child for fundraising for them. And Matt Gates, too, you know, given the investigation into his um, alleged sex trafficking of a minor. You know, they are not people they want to be propping up as the face of the Republican Party anymore. But um, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene can say all of the the crazy nonsense she wants to, but as long as she's able to fundraise the way she does, she's always gonna have that spot cozy up next to to the leadership. So so it makes sense that there's this division there, but yeah. I can't fathom why Lauren Boebert would sort of take that jab, aside from the fact that she's just too stupid to realize that it might you know, cause some division. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's if it's just a personal thing or if this is a branding thing. Um, Marjorie Greene is more popular on the right than Lauren Boebert. Maybe Lauren Boebert wants to get <laughs> elevated by trying to take her down. They all see this as a zero sum thing. But yeah, from from the very beginning, she was ready with that. I'm often accused of agreeing with her. Well, actually, <laughs> we're talking about where you disagree with her, so it feels like you're needlessly making it about that. I appreciated the reference to. The Jewish space lasers, although she's uh, never forget that despite the fact that she's popular, Lauren Boebert is horrible at this, which is why she had to fumble to even get to the concept of a Jewish space laser. But whatever. Um, as much as I might have enjoyed it, Marjorie Green, not so much. And she tweeted this about it, about Lauren Boebert. She gladly takes our money, but when she's been asked, Lauren refuses to endorse President Trump. She refuses to support Kevin McCarthy, and she childishly threw me out of the bus for a cheap sound bite, which. Yeah, I, that's all true. I, I agree with Marjorie. It was childish. She did throw her to the bus for a cheap sound bite. Marjorie Green is actually right here. Uh, the country is facing extremely difficult times. Americans expect conservative fighters like us to work together to save America. And that is the only mission I'm 100% devoted to, not high school drama and media sound bites. Well, to be fair, you could have not responded then. And by the <laughs> way, it wasn't that she just tweeted this, she quote tweeted, the video of that sound bite. So you can't say that you're totally not in it about the sound bites when you're directly responding and spreading the sound bite right there. But again, I get it. She was attacked. She gets to respond. She says, I've supported and donated to Lauren Boebert. President Trump has supported and donated to Lauren Boebert. Kevin McCarthy has supported and donated to Lauren Boebert. She just barely came through by 500 votes. <laughs> so that is a good little hit at Lauren Boebert. But there's a little bit of friendly fire there. Did you notice it? So she's mocking Lauren Boebert for having trouble getting reelected. But you're also pointing out that the collective funding and support of Marjorie Greene, Kevin McCarthy, and President Trump himself 
got her a win by 500 votes. Jeez, it's a Republican district. Why didn't she do better when these like these huge titanic figures on the right were supporting her? You guys don't necessarily come out of that looking that much better. But anyway, what'd you make of the response? I think it, it's, you know, all of this is funny because I like to see Republicans attack each other. But um, pointing out the 500 votes, I think sort of is. It acknowledges that there is a reason why Lauren Boebert would want to distance herself from Marjorie Taylor Greene and Trump. Because the district, despite being heavily Republican, pretty resoundly attempted to reject her in this last election. Like she she got reelected by the skin of her teeth. Um, so distancing herself from Trump, distancing, her, distancing herself from the uh, the more the the loony wing of the Republican Party might benefit her when it comes time to run again two years from now. But I, yeah. you know, I think it's silly because she's standing there next to Jack Posobiec, a literal white supremacist. So you know, who she picks That's and chooses point. to distance herself from, and Matt Gates, you know, a uh, alleged pedophile. So <laughs> it just seems it's so arbitrary. But you know, she's never had good political instincts. Her campaign has never had good political instincts. So it doesn't surprise me that yeah. she would, you know, make those mistakes. That that is a great point, and they say that supposedly the rift between Bober and Green started in April when Green was at I think it was Nick Fuentes's America First thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, if Bober was legitimately horrified by her going to that thing, that reflects at least somewhat well on Lauren Bobert, Although it's undercut, as you say, by the fact that she's also hanging out with people who act that way. But um. Yeah, look, I wouldn't want to be associated with Marjorie Green either. And and I also think, and I think this has been clear for a very long time. From a from a thousand miles up, looking at Marjorie Green and Lauren Bober, they're similar in a lot of ways. But I think that Lauren Bober will be whatever she needs to be to be popular in the Republican Party. I think if the Republican Party starts to be a little bit more sane, I think that she will try to mirror that. I think that she's an idiot, so she'll have a hard time doing it, but I think she'll try. Green is, in my view, much more of an actual true believer. I think that Green literally is a dumb person on the internet who believes every conspiracy theory that she reads. I think Lauren Boeber is playing a game to some extent. I think that she's, I'm not saying that she's not awful and racist or homophobic or whatever. I'm sure that she is. But I think it's also sort of like a suit she puts on to be popular, whereas Green can't help it. This is what she actually thinks. And so, I, if I were Lauren Boebert in that case, and I knew that this is supposed to be a game we play for the rubes, I would be horrified by a true believer too. Like, why are you taking this so seriously? This is just a way we make money and stay in power. You're a kind of a weirdo. I think there might be a little bit of that um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes people say, do you think that like uh, the Republicans who are anti-vax actually got vaccinated. I'll say yes, all of them, except for Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. I know in her heart of hearts, she genuinely believes that she will become a magnet if she takes the vaccine <laughs> or that you know she'll like grow a third arm or she'll be able to walk through walls or something. She's genuinely, genuinely like believes yeah. the things she says. She believes in the Jewish space lasers, all the conspiracy theories. And we know that because that's who she was before she got into office. So we see a lot of like these career politicians who, you know, give lip service to these conspiracy theories once they're elected because they're playing to a base. But she was part of that base. She came from that base to get elected into, into Congress. So she, yeah, like you said, very much a true believer. Yeah, um, I, I wanna play one more video in just a second, just to see. I always like to check how much of a bubble I'm in because I've never found Lauren Boebert to be, like I know that she sees herself as being the next Sarah Palin or something like that. I don't think that she has it. I don't think that she can deliver. Now, she's doing these speeches and appearances for a very low bar in terms of intelligence, ability to communicate, charisma, and all that. But I want to show you this little bit of her trying to like fire up a crowd and get them excited for her. And you, and you tell me how she did. And we're going to make y'all proud. We're going to make America proud. We are going to weed out the deep state, and that includes the sorry Department of Injustice. We are going to take our country back. We will not relent. We will not retreat. We are moving forward, forward from a place of victory, and we are going to put America first. God bless you. 
I'm not the target audience for that, I get it. But uh, I didn't think that was that great. And the audience seems to side with me. That was supposed to be a speech that she is screaming over raucous applause. That's why she's weirdly yelling there. Because the idea is it's gonna be like this epic moment. But like you weren't screaming over a raucous, you were just sort of screaming. Like making <laughs> up things like from a place of victory. Like no, the red wave didn't happen. Like and you won by like a couple of school buses full of people. Like it's not an amazing victory. I didn't find it to be convincing. That that to me did not smack of here's the next Trump or anything. What did you think? It reminded me so much of the best is yet mm -hmm. to come. <laughs> I mean, it's like embarrassing to watch her up there screaming to no applause or to weak applause. I mean, it's it's awkward because she's reading someone else's words. She didn't write that speech, um, but she was told to deliver it a certain way. And she just doesn't have the ability to gauge like that she should scale back because she's not getting sure. the you know the result the response that they intended for her to be getting while she was delivering it so they probably just said hey you're going to need to talk loudly to you know to hear yourself over the yelling and the applause uh, that never came but she yeah. like couldn't gauge that oh then I shouldn't yell so she's just up there Screaming <laughs> and like awkwardly delivering these lines that she's clearly not comfortable saying. Like she doesn't necessarily have a voice that you can write for. She's not a good public speaker. Anytime yeah. she does like a public address, it feels extremely awkward. And she's like reading a script. She doesn't take the pauses where a person would normally pause. She doesn't have it. She's she doesn't yeah. whatever it is that gets you elected, you know, to the higher office that helps you, you know, lead a movement. She doesn't have it. Yeah, I think that's why when she gets a line that she thinks is good, she like runs it into the ground, like the constantly talking about lesbian dance theory in college or Fauci out made up <laughs> Fauci out. Oh god, or making up an interaction with Ilhan Omar where she called her a terrorist or something. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you're you're not the next Sarah Palin. You're not and, and by the way, like I, I sort of also get another reason why she probably doesn't like Marjorie Green. Neither of them are ever gonna be appealing to the right based on any policy or whatever. They're Republicans, why would they be? But Marjorie Greene is a true believer. Marjorie Greene believes insane stuff and she will never stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. Lauren Boebert's just kind of like her, it's like she's young, I guess, and she's a woman. So she's got that, that stands out from other Republican politicians. Other than that, what does she stand for? What makes her interesting or distinct from any, like she occasionally says something awful. Yeah, that's true, I guess. I don't know. I just I I don't I don't see this going the way she thinks it will. Um, it'll be very interesting to see who challenges her in two years. She will be lucky to keep her seat. If if the Democrats had spent an extra million dollars, she wouldn't even be in Congress in a month. So anyway, we'll see what happens with her. With that said, why don't we move to someone else? As much issue as I might have. With her, and and by the way, there is a little bit of mystery in her in her backstory. I don't think it holds a candle to this new guy. So let's let's talk about uh, this dude. An incoming Republican congressman, you're seeing right there, George Santos has got a little bit of explaining to do about his background. A lot of the story, the legend, the mythology of himself that he ran on to get elected. Doesn't seem to have any backing whatsoever. So here is what we know about him. Okay, so he's the son of a Brazil of Brazilian immigrants, first openly gay Republican to win a House seat as a non-incumbent. So that's that's impressive in today's Republican Party. Um, by his account, he started off at a New York City public co college and then immediately like rocketed into fame and fortune. Okay, he became a seasoned Wall Street financier and investor. Okay, with a family owned real estate portfolio of 13 properties. So a little bit inconsistent with the idea that you were just some kid pulling yourself up by your bootstraps at a public college when your family owns many, many properties, but whatever. So here's the thing, people have looked into many of the specific claims he has made about his background, including the New York Times. They've looked at public documents, court filings. There doesn't seem to be evidence of much of any of it. And take a load, uh, take a look at the things that he made up. So, or at least hasn't yet proven. Uh, Citigroup and Goldman Sachs, those are firms that he says he worked for, told the Times they have no record of ever working there. <laughs> Which, okay, maybe if you were a summer intern or something, the documentation would have been lost. But if you were a 
seasoned Wall Street financier and investor, I think they'd remember you. The dude's not 80, okay? He was there a couple of years ago, supposedly. So there's no proof of that. There's little evidence that his animal rescue group, Friends of Pets United, was, as he claims, a tax exempt organization. The IRS could find no record of a registered charity with that name. His education also suspect. He said that he graduated with, with a degree in economics and finance from Baruch College, a public four year college in New York City, back in 2010, so only 12 years ago. But representatives from the school told the Times they had no record of his enrollment, despite searching multiple variations of his name. Again, it wasn't that long ago. Also, he says he went to NYU, but a spokesman for that university says they have no attendance records that match his name and birth date. So his work history, his charitable history, his education history appear to be made up. And you're probably thinking, well, that's about as bad as it could get. It can get worse because he has also claimed that he has lost. This is like, I guess, to make him seem like kind of a victim in a business sense. He's lost four employees in the 2016 Pulse nightclub shooting. He made that claim during an interview after his election, but New York Times found that none of the 49 victims of that shooting appeared to be associated with any of his firms in any way. And look, there are a lot more questions about this guy, about where his money came from since he doesn't have the education he says, he doesn't have the work history he says. There's a lot of issues there, but it's fascinating how little backing he has provided for virtually any of this. What do you think, Rivana? I think everybody lies on their resume a little bit. Um, but most people who lie on their resume aren't applying, you know, to be uh, someone holding federal office. So their background isn't looked into as extensively as someone who is running for federal office, and and they don't have investigative journalists looking into their claims. So, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. I think that. He's not the only person. We saw Madison Cawthorn, same playbook. Nobody really knew where his money came from. He had no work history whatsoever, but he said he was involved in all these businesses that turned out not to be true. They like what the Republican Party does is they find someone who they think they can create a story about, pitch them as a candidate, build them up to be, you know, uh, that guy, and then run them. And you know, he's been he's won election. So now it's gonna be two years before they can, you know, people can do something about all these lies he told during his campaigns. It's the voters are in a in a crappy position. His constituents are in a crappy position, but he uh, he got away with it <laughs> until yeah. now. Yeah, at least as of right now. And one thing he has going for him going forward is that he's a Republican. So the likelihood of anything being done is very different in that case. Like like I think about some of the Democrats that have left office for affairs or for. Like Al Franken stepped down uh, as a result of the the picture that came out. This guy totally made up who he is, or or didn't. Okay, maybe it's real, and weirdly, there's no evidence of it. Um, so far, there's been no indication that it bothers the leadership of the Republican Party. That this guy is fundamentally a liar about virtually everything. And like like think about him in comparison to other candidates that have come out recently. Herschel Walker told a <laughs> lot of lies, but you know what Herschel Walker also did. He actually played football. Like, there's at least something in his past that he talked about that is based in truth. With this guy, did is there anything a voter can point to? A claim that he made? Are his parents who he says that they are? Like, do we even know that at this point? And so far, the Republican Party isn't pushing for him to answer these questions, let alone to step down. I will I will end with this. He put out a statement after all this news blew up. And he says, George Santos represents the kind of progress that the left is so threatened by. A gay Latino first generation American and Republican who won a Biden district. Well, wait, I thought that the Democratic Party was taken over by the gay agenda. Why would they be against a gay Latino candidate? That doesn't make any sense. You guys are constantly attacking them for being <laughs> in the bag for those populations, whatever, okay. Big gay as it were. <laughs> hey, big gay, exactly. Uh, and then goes on, blah, 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 blah. It's no surprise that Congressman elect Santos has enemies, the New York Times, who are attempting to smear his good name. Is it even his name? I don't know. <laughs> With these defamatory allegations, as Winston Churchill famously stated, you have enemies, good. It means that you've stood up for something sometime in your life. And in true George Santos fashion, that does not appear to be a thing that Winston Churchill actually said. Some guy in 2009 is alleged to have actually said it. So he's even <laughs> making up his quotes. And it's a vapid quote anyway. You could use that as a response to any criticism of you. 
You'll notice something that's missing from that paragraph. Denying literally any of the claims that have been made against him or evidence of any of the claims that he's made. Weirdly, he didn't have room in his statement for any of that. That to me confirms that he's lying about this stuff. So hopefully the pressure stays on him. I hate the position I have put us in where we don't have time to get to both of our blocks. But I know that you talked about this D block, so we're at least gonna get to that. Let's jump into it. And the distinction between misinformation and lying is that misinformation can be true. Not a single person in the crowd on January 6th was found to be carrying a firearm, not one. The only insurrection in history with no guns, an insurrection that wasn't armed, wasn't planned, and didn't actually insurrect anything. Why are they calling it insurrection? Is it possible that the vaccine actually can hurt you? People who take it are more likely to die of COVID. People who get the booster are more likely to get the latest variant. Inject your children with a drug with no actual benefits. The trans thing seems pretty new. Now, gender affirming care is a euphemism for chemical castration radical plastic surgery and other treatments for gender dysphoria. At Boston Children's Hospital, they're cutting the breasts off of healthy children. So Boston Children's Hospital is now playing the victim here. Anyone who criticizes this is a threat and a danger. <laughs> no one really believes in global warming. The IRS has its own army. Where are all these racial acts of terror committed by white supremacists? Joe Biden's latest idea is to pay black people to smoke more crap. Watergate, which no one can still explain even to this day, got that you degraded freaks. Good Lord, amazing work there by a friend of the show, Kat Abagazale over at Media Matters. You should be going to Media Matters for amazing analysis of the insane stuff that the right wing is getting up to every day. But also follow Kat on Twitter because her tweets are amazing, her mashups are amazing. She came with all of the receipts for, I mean, you can't cover all of the lies that Tucker Carlson tells in a year and we're gonna reference some more. But you should also know that Media Matters has given Tucker Carlson the greatest honor of his career. He is their misinformer of the year. And I think, I think Ravana, that he, he put in the hours and he worked for it. I think that while he has been given a lot in his career that he didn't deserve, uh, i.e., everything, uh, I think this was well deserved. Oh, absolutely. He ran a really fantastic campaign leading up to uh, winning this award. I can't think of anyone who deserves it more than he does. I do just want to say that one thing that always sticks out to me about like, Tucker Carlson and other conservative pundits is when they say things like the breasts of healthy children. That yeah. just creeps me out. Like they'll try to call, you know, queer people like me groomers or pedophiles without any evidence. And then they'll like fetishize children's chests. I, they're just so disgusting. He's just such a disgusting pig. Yeah, 100%. They love, look, I, I don't know about any of these individual guys. I don't know if it's just political convenience. I don't know. What Matt Walsh thinks about the fact that every single show that he does, he has to attack the trans community for an hour. But they do talk a lot about kids' genitals. Like it's pretty much constant at this point. I'm not saying that means anything. I'm not saying that the FBI should take their hard drive or whatever. I'm just saying <laughs> it's noteworthy. As Tucker Carlson would say, why isn't anyone talking about this? You're not <laughs> even allowed to ask questions about what they're Googling. I'm just saying it's probably weird. Best case scenario, it's weird. Anyway, um, not everything could be fit into that little clip. So I want to remind you that uh, while he lied about all the things they talked about there, there were a lot of lies. There was constant lies about the war in Ukraine, defense of what Russia was doing, defense of the war crimes, about vaccination, about immigration, about the great replacement theory, about January 6th, about whether white supremacy even exists as a thing. Lies about women in the military, women in general, about men's sperm levels and levels of testosterone, about the government of Hungary and what ideology it actually is following, about green M&Ms, about Paul Pelosi's being attacked, about just pick a thing and he was lying about it. And he has been rewarded more than almost anyone else in media. Endless new shows and new opportunities and more and more and more money for never doing anything but misinforming and leading to more division and hate in our country. So anyway, thank you Media Matters for that mashup, very well done. With that said, we have no more time in our first hour, but we do have more show to come. So don't go anywhere, we'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.